Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm the money. Every penny of it. That's right. I'm Cam the Provocateur. <laughs> I was just going to call you the money for the rest of the episode, but that oh. either works. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, I'm the money every week, so, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I've called you worse, to be fair. But <laughs> it's a big week this week. There's some sort of celebration going on. Someone's turning 60. He's in a man, and he's named James Bond. And so we've got a few things going on over the next two weeks. We've got a couple of Spy Master interviews coming your way, which we'll tell you the details of in the episode. And we also have a special review of Casino Royale 1954 coming out next week. Uh, I can't wait to talk about Peter Laurie once again. But to celebrate 007 turning 60, we have a very special film this week for you. And to break it down, we thought we'd bring on a very special agent. It is none other than, well, a man who has written the character of James Bond. He certainly knows what he's talking about. At least 12 books under his name about Bond, Mr. Raymond Benson. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Hi, Scott. Hi, Cam. I'm doing very well. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. No, thank you for being here. Yeah, it, it's it's a big anniversary. It's 60 years of a, a certain character that we're somewhat familiar with, I suppose. So uh, nothing too big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, next year is the 70th anniversary of the books. So Yeah, quite uh, right. Indeed. You know, the- they just these anniversaries. They just keep coming. <laughs> we'll find any reason to celebrate. To be fair, it'll be the it'll be the twenty fifth anniversary of Die Another Day or something like that soon enough, and we'll yeah. all be we'll, we'll all be celebrating the Invisible Car. But um, yeah, I yeah. yeah, I don't know about that. No, I, <laughs> maybe not. But uh, we'll, we'll peel away from that. But uh, before we talk about this week's film, um, your credentials sort of exceed doing this anyway. There's no need to really do it. But for those who do not know who you are, sir. Um, just tell us a little bit about how you got connected with the world of James Bond. Well, that could that could take up half of our uh, our <laughs> podcast here, um, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a child of the '50s and and '60s, and I was lucky enough to see the the original films on the big screen. Uh, the first one I saw was Goldfinger. I was nine years old, and my father took me to see it. And then, uh, you know, just a few months later the double bill of Dr. No and From Russia With Love came out. And so I saw the first three films on the big screen within a year while I was nine years old. Um, and that, of course, had a big impact on me. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> it was, you know, and you got to remember the Bond films were the Star Wars of the 60s. You know, they were the big blockbusters. There was nothing else. Um, and... Um, So I became a fan. I actually then started picking up the Ian Fleming novels and started reading them at a very young age. And, um, you know, some of it probably went over my head at the time, but I got the stories and I thought they were great and reread them a few years later when I was a little older and reread them again later and reread them again later. Uh, Followed the series all the way through and, you know, considered myself a big fan. But, you know, I kind of became a normal person and (laughs) and went to college and studied theater and uh, Ended up in New York City, directing plays, composing music, you know, doing that thing for many years. Uh, But then in the 80s, the early 80s, um, I had this, um, well, I I was with a group of friends and they, uh, a question was posed over the table in drinks. uh, What book would you write if you had to write a book? And we went around the table and I said, well, gee, I'd. I think I'd like to write a encyclopedia uh, history coffee table book about James Bond because there was nothing like that at the time that encompassed everything. You know, a biography of Ian Fleming, uh, a history of the phenomenon, analyses and critiques of all the books and all the movies, all in one tome. We had had, a, you know, a couple of books on the films. Uh, we'd had biographies of Ian Fleming. We'd had one or two books on the novels but nothing together. And so I wanted to fill that gap. And I started pursuing that. It took me three years. I went over to England and met uh, members of Ian Fleming's family and his colleagues and business people and uh, the people at uh, what was then called Glidrose, now Ian Fleming Publications. And um, 
we got along. The book was finally published, The James Bond Bedside Companion, in 1984. And they were impressed. Uh, I kind of, that established my credentials as sort of a Bond expert, whatever that means. I got involved with the American Fan Club. I uh, started appearing at conventions and so forth. And uh, But, you know, my life went on. I was uh, writing and designing computer games in the late 80s and early 90s. And then out of the blue, in 1995, uh, Peter Jansen Smith, who was Ian Fleming's literary agent and the the man who was chairman of Glid Rose at the time, he called me out of the blue one morning and just said, uh, Raymond, John Gardner has uh, decided to hang up the hat and, and retire from the gig. How would you like to give it a shot? Just out of the blue, you know. Uh, <laughs> no and, pressure. Yeah. <laughs> And I, you know, I just kind of went, well, <laughs> okay, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a rigorous sort of audition process, but I got the job and um, spent seven years writing Bond novels. Now, I'm curious. Um, I think a lot of fans have, you know, a James Bond story they'd love to tell or, you know, think to themselves, like, I could write a James Bond novel. What I would like to know is, you know, when you're given this opportunity, what are the biggest challenges, the biggest hurdles in actually making that a reality, like actually telling that story? Well, um, I think what my strengths were, were, were that I knew the universe really, really well. I knew the books. I knew the Fleming novels inside and out. I'd read all of Gardner's books, everything that had come before me. Um, and uh, I had honed my fiction writing uh, in the while I was doing the computer games because the the what I the kinds of games I was writing were the adventure style, mm -hmm. you know, story based games where there's a plot and a story and you're a character that's moving through that story and you're encountering obstacles and you've got to get around those obstacles and there's characters and there's dialogue. So, you know, the scripts I was writing for these games were like phone books, big giant, you know, with lots of different paths of what you could take and stuff. So that's really kind of where I learned it. But also my theater training um, as a director of stage plays, you know, you really learn how to analyze a script and how to analyze story and beats and uh, three act structure. Uh, all of that was ingrained in me. So, you know, even though I had not written a novel <laughs> yet, um, my first novel was a James Bond novel published worldwide. <laughs> Uh, so that's pretty extraordinary, I got to say. Um, I, even I appreciate the the weirdness of that. Um, but I, I I rose to it. The, the, I guess the the big challenge for me was uh, becoming a British writer because uh, I, obviously I was the first American to do it, and um, you know I had to watch my Americanisms. I had I, I did go to England a lot during those seven years. I was there four four times a year. So, you know, I gradually, by the third book, I was, I was speaking like a Brit and, and, and writing like one too, but you know, the first book. And so, you know, they, the, the, the British publisher and uh, the people at Glid Rose were very good at helping me, you know, uh, with the Americanisms and making sure that there weren't any and things like that. Um, and that, I guess that was the toughest part, but you know, I, th I think I rose to the challenge. All right. Um, as far as writing the plots, um, what I did was I would get a map. You know, well, first of all, we had a big sit down to talk about what direction we would go because Gardner had set his books contemporary. We had discussed a little bit about, well, what if we put it back in the 50s or the 60s and, you know, did that. But uh, Peter decided that since the movies had just rebooted with Pierce Brosnan when GoldenEye was a big success, he said, why don't we keep in sync with those films and, and in fact, make your M a woman, too. Uh, so they really wanted my books to be kind of like the films of the time, you know, with a little more action and a little more humor. And but 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 I said, you know, look, I want to keep Bond, you know, pure like Fleming's Bond. I, I wanted all of his vices intact. And uh, they said, well, that might be a little anachronis anachronistic now, but if you can do it, do it. And I think I did. Um, 
the plots, I would get a map of the world and pinpoint areas of the world that Britain was in, uh, concerned about. Uh, for example, in Zero Minus Ten, the first book, uh, obviously Hong Kong was, was an issue. I knew the book would be published in 1997, which was the year Hong Kong was handed back to China. So I thought that's a perfect situation, you know, some, some kind of intrigue going on in Hong Kong. Uh, with the second book, it was the Cyprus situation because Britain kind of is a policeman in, in Cyprus. Uh, you know, there's the Turkish side and the Greek side that are always, you know, skirmishing. Uh, so it was stuff like that. Um, and once I once I pinpointed a locale and a history, I would do some research into the you know why Britain was involved, uh, and usually the plot grew out of that. Well, in in between doing your own books, you were also sort of making novelizations of the films. That's right. Which is, I imagine, a completely different beast as well because it's uh, the concept is not necessarily yours at that point. You're just. Is it is it like fleshing the world out? How how is it different from maybe creating your own story to sort of novelizing a film? Well, it took a year to do my own stories. You know, I would come up with scratch, you know, from scratch the story, and I would do it. I was required to do an outline to show uh, Glidros uh, and the British publisher and the American publisher what I was going to do. Um, so it was a long process, much more you know a longer process, and I would travel to all the locations that I was writing about. So I went to Hong Kong, I went to Cyprus, I went to all these places. Um, and so that took a lot of time. It was, you know, a year per book. The novelizations, I had six weeks to write each Whoa. time. Okay. So, uh, right. because they had to have, the publisher had to have the manuscript six months before the publication date. So in each time, the film was still being shot. So I was get I was getting I got the script, you know, an early version of the script, and then every day I would get faxed pages of the script as it was being changed, um, and it was just a case, yes, of you know, if you were going to put in prose everything that's in a screenplay, you're going to be about thirty thousand words too short for a novel, uh, so you do have to flesh it out. Uh, luckily, I was able, in most cases, especially the first one and the second one, to add some scenes that weren't mm -hmm. in the script. Uh, for example, I gave Wei Lin a, a background chapter. Uh, I, you know, got permission to do it and, you know, told Eon what I was doing and they said fine. Um, so, yeah. Um, but that was more of a, more of a, wow, the pressure's on. I've got to really turn it out. Um, it was a very different kind of beast. So I do prefer the original novels over the, the three novelizations. <laughs> I can I can buy that. Now I, I'm curious. You know, the Bond universe is so, filled with so many iconic characters. You've written your own adventures. What are your favorite? Do you have a favorite character that you've created for the canon of Bond? A favorite character? Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Hmm. Well, I, I like my Felix Leiter because I am from Texas. Uh, Felix is supposed to be from Texas. Um, I think I gave. I think Fleming actually did a good job of, of you know, forming a Texan operatives. Uh, he didn't quite get the language right. Uh, so, uh, but, but I like his, his, his Felix a lot. Uh, his Felix was much more jovial and let's go get some drinks, you know, <laughs> let's go get drunk. That kind of guy, which was never really portrayed in the movies. Uh, I don't think the... Felix of Fleming was ever really shown in the movies at all. So, you know, I kind of just grabbed onto that and, and, and gave my Felix a real Texan vibe that I think was, was realistic. Um, as far as, uh, you know, um, I like my, um, I like the female in High Time to Kill, Hope Kindle. Um, I don't know. It's been so long since I've even read. <laughs> you know, it, fair enough. I can barely remember them. So, <laughs> well, people that have clicked play on this episode have a fair idea about what we're talking about this week. And before I introduce it, I think the last question I want to ask you, Raymond, is: Yeah, you, know, you stopped doing the Bond novelizations with Dying the Day was the last one that was published. Um, yeah. And this film we're talking about happens a few years afterwards. At right. that period in time where you Dying of the Day had been published, what was your opinion on where the Bond films were going? How were you feeling about the Bond franchise 
are in around about 2002, 2003? Well, because, you know, I did work on Die Another Day, as writing the novelization. Uh, I was involved. So, um, you know, I, I, I can't really say um, what my feelings about the movie were. I was, you know, I, I enjoyed writing the book. Um, I thought, it, you know, they were starting, you know, if you look at the, each actor's series of films, they get progressively more fantastic mm -hmm. uh, in a way, you know. I mean, you know, the Roger Moore series uh, from Live and Let Die through Moonraker, that was going to be his, his, his body of work until they talked him into doing more, you know. And you can see that from Live and Let Die to Moonraker, there's a big leap in fantastical, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, a lot of more humor and, and science fiction and, you know, that's not possible, but, it, you know, hopefully it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That kind of that kind of thing. And I think the, the Brosnans were getting that way, you know, and Die mm. Another Day had, had a lot of, okay, we've got a Korean guy who changes his face to a British guy and the voice and everything completely changes. Okay, I guess we can buy that. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then there's the invisible car and him, you know, doing the surfing on the on the waves and, you know. So, yeah, eh, but there's things I like about Die Another Day. I mean, you know, um, especially like the first half. Um, uh, I'm not going to knock it. It was fun. No, it's it's more just a case of there'd been 20 films by that point. It had just celebrated an anniversary in 2002. It was a big time for, for Bond. And I suppose the question is more, had you had your definitive film at this point? Maybe not past this week's film, but like in those first 20, had you had a favorite? Like, was there one that you thought this was the perfect adaptation? Or yes. This was the perfect James Bond film. Yes. From Russia with Love. <laughs> that will always be yeah. my favorite. That will always be my favorite film. Uh, in fact, I, I look back to Dr. No and From Russia With Love as my two favorite Bond films of all of them. Um, you know, it, it might be my age that, you know, I experienced them at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think they capture, you know, Fleming's voice, Fleming's world. They take themselves seriously. They take their time to tell a story rather than the boom, 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 action, 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 and a little bit of story, action, 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 a little bit of story, action, 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 you know, that the Bond films became. Uh, Goldfinger, of course, is, you know, the one that really established the blueprint of how the films would be made from then on. Uh, they always kind of look back at Goldfinger and say, well, you know, what did we do with that? And let's try to do something like that again. Um, it, you know, Goldfinger is probably my third favorite, you know, and it was the first one I saw. Uh, Goldfinger actually, in my opinion, is the most influential film of the 1960s in pop culture terms uh, because it spawned so many imitations and style, stylistic uh, innovations that many, many films copied. Um, you know, and after that, you know, then it's just variations on the theme. So, uh, I mean, I have my favorites going forward. Um, I prefer, you know, all the 60s films just mm -hmm. because uh, that's my time, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I know people younger than me, you know. If, if you saw Moonraker as your first Bond film, that might be your favorite. You know, that's fine. I, I appreciate that. There's people uh, out there that say Dine of the Day is their favorite. Fair I know, too. I know, I know. Sure. It's it's amazing. There's this little app online called the Sorta Dot app. Have you seen that where mm -hmm. you can rank your rank your Bond films? Yep. You know, everybody was posting, you know, their rankings, and everybody's different. There's not one single ranking that's the same as somebody else's. Uh, and that's what's cool about the Bond films is that um, they're throughout the history of them. Uh, each one, I you know, each decade sort of reflects the films of that decade. I mean, you can really have a pop culture history lesson by watching them all in chronological order. I mean, the, the 70s films definitely speak 1970s and so on. Um, so, yeah, it kind of depends how old you are and what your life experience is. You know, it's got, they've got something for everybody. Well, I think we've proven your expertise on James Bond 
Raymond. I, I, I think I think you pass uh, muster on that one. Uh, so the question now goes to you, Cam. It's the 60th anniversary of James Bond. Maybe we should do something special. What are we talking about this week? Yes, we are going to revisit the 1967 Casino Royale. No, I kid, I kid. We are going to tackle the 2006 Casino Royale, the launch of the Daniel Craig era. Right. Well, we, you know, we can't talk about that without talking about the 1967 version as well as the 1954 version. Mm-hmm. They're both very important. People who just, just, just dismiss them and don't ever watch them, I find that fascinating. I think you should look at your sources, find things out, watch and see what you liked about them. But we're talking about 2006. Usually the question I would ask at this point is, where was everyone when this film came out? What is your experience? What is your memory of the time? Raymond, I'll ask you, what do you remember about 2006 when Casino Royale first came out? Well, I was, you know, definitely... Uh... It was four years after my Bond work, and I was doing other things. I was writing my own novels. Uh, I was also, at that time, doing some other tie-in work. I was working for the Tom Clancy estate. Well, he was still alive at the time, uh, doing the Splinter Cell novels, uh, as well as my own books. Um, so I was looking forward. I was I was in a mindset that I really wanted to get away from Bond, because I had, you know, it was... It was a rough, I mean, I wouldn't say a rough seven years, but it was a very uh, stressful uh, seven years. I was constantly working and traveling and on the go. Uh, And it was hard work. So, you know, I had to kind of reboot myself and establish myself as, you know, a writer of stuff that wasn't James Bond. Um, But, you know, I was was still very interested. I wanted to see it, you know, and then I wanted to see what this this new guy, Daniel Craig, Craig could do. Um, you know, I, I didn't buy into all that, you know, nonsense that was going on when he was cast about him being blonde and everything. I was going, oh, who cares? Um, you know, I didn't understand that at all. That was kind of crazy. But man, when it when I saw the movie, um, I was I was quite blown away. Uh, I would I would rank Casino Royale 2006 in my top five of all the films. Okay, well that's so you, you had a probably number four after Goldfinger. <laughs> okay, so it's up there, and you had a, a good experience with it in 2006. Good. What about you, Cam? So yeah, I remember um, there was all the kind of the, the negativity about Daniel Craig being Bond, and a lot of that was just very like superficial things. But I do remember when he was cast that both my sister and I, who had grown up on James Bond, were like, eh? Like, it was not at all what we anticipated. And I remember the two of us, you know, like, we were drawing on things like we'd seen him in, like, Tomb Raider. And um, um, I'm trying to think, um, uh, Road to Perdition and things like that. But it was like, could not wrap my head around it. And I was also, I guess, coming off of an era where they really cast very recognizable actors. Um, in those movies, you know, when you watch World is Not Enough, say what you will about the movie. We knew who Denise Richards were, was. We knew who Robert Carlyle was. They were very recognizable people. And as they kind of started to trot out the cast of Casino Royale, it was like, a, okay, I don't really recognize most of these people. I knew of Ava Green from um, Kingdom of Heaven, but it's it felt very low wattage. And I was struggling with what they were doing. I wasn't I think I was, I'd also lost some confidence after Die Another Day, which was so all over the place that it was like, I don't know that I'm 100% on board. I don't know what this is. But I remember the second I saw the teaser trailer, I was like, okay, I wasn't concerned. And I went, you know, opening weekend and was absolutely blown away. I think at this point, uh, yeah, this was the only Bond movie I went and saw a second time in theaters. I would go on in the future and see them multiple times. But at the time, that was the first one that got me back. And I was someone who felt very loyal to Brosnan coming out of that era. And there was kind of that whiff of like, he was kind of, you know, publicly feeling hurt about being dismissed. And so I think there was some loyalty there. But Craig won myself over, my sister over, and everyone we knew over immediately watching this movie. And we really fell in love with it. I was a bit of a different story, actually. I distinctly remember the marketing. I remember it being very much everywhere. It's a new James Bond. It's not your daddy's James Bond, that sort of stuff you see in the British tabloids. Um, and I, I'm a massive Chris Cornell fan. Of course. So having him do the, the, the song is I, blew me away. I've seen, I've seen Soundgarden. I've seen Audio Slave. 
both live. I've seen Chris Cornell live by himself. Like that, I I was in in that sense, I was hooked. But I just didn't really seem to want to go past Pierce Brosnan in my head, and so I actually don't think I saw it in cinema. I think I actually waited until home release before I actually watched it, just through, like Cam said, some sort of strange loyalty to a man who isn't doing it anymore who i imagine probably would still would have done a fifth film but that's by the by and so when i did see it i was like why did i not see this in cinemas why on earth did mm-hmm. i not go because it it blew me away and i was uh, worried going into it like it was this action bond and it was losing a lot of what it used to have but it worked it just worked everything about the film worked and and I was hooked on Daniel Craig after that and saw all the rest of his films in, in theaters, yeah. Yeah, like it really won, I think, everyone over. And it was coming off that trend, the, you know, Batman Begins kind of kicked it off of doing kind of the more sophisticated, some would use the word gritty, but I think that's really up in the air when you revisit Batman Begins. <laughs> but sort of that more realistic slant on kind of a, you know, a classic story character, a classic hero character. And at the time, like because I had really liked Batman Begins, I was like, what are the chances that you're going to have another really great example of this so quickly? Um, because Bond is famous for jumping on trends. You know, we referenced, uh, referenced Moonraker, you know, jumping on the Star Wars trend, and there's, there's been various others. So I was genuinely blown away that this one was not only, you know, on par with something like Batman Begins, but in a lot of ways better. Well, I think they, I think they were influenced more by the Bourne movies because uh, they mm-hmm. started in 2002. And 2000, you know, they so they had seen two of those. Uh, they were already filming Casino Royale when, you know, before Batman Begins even appeared. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, I think, yeah, the Bourne movies really had a, the style of the Bourne movies had an influence. But, you know, they, they, they got the rights. I mean, you got to think about the whole history of the rights of Casino Royale and how they, it came about. Uh, to why they decided to go this this direction, um, I mean, you know, very quickly, the the rights to Casino Royale has a tortured history. <laughs> you know? We have uh, chronicled them um, on the Casino Royale sixty seven episode we did. They are unbelievable. <laughs> I know, but in nineteen ninety nine, Eon finally got well. You know, M, uh, MGM Eon got the rights finally. Uh, from uh, Colombia, because of a you know it, it all became you know all, uh, again it was all kind of due to Kevin McClory and his lawsuit again, and then Sony uh, taking over you know both MGM and Columbia and then them going well let's make a little swap and you know they traded Spider Man rights for for Casino Royale rights and finally they had them. And because Casino Royale is so much an origin story in itself, inherently, they they realized, well, we can't just, you know, do a fifth Pierce Brosnan movie with Casino Royale. And, you know, Barbara, I know, and Michael both really wanted to do this story. They've been wanting to do Casino Royale for a long time and never could because uh, it is one, a great story. Um, so, you know, they decided, look, we're going to have to just reboot, cast a new guy, a younger guy, and pretend it's the beginning. And, uh, you know, it was very different. Um, and now now that the complete five movies of Daniel Craig have, have come about, we now see that they are sort of a standalone arc, a standalone universe, separate from the other Bond films. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you have to look at it that way. Um, You'll drive yourself crazy. Every now and then they would do an Easter egg, a nudge, nudge, wink, wink to the other films, you know, by showing, you know, uh, uh, Bernard Lee's portrait in, in the uh, in the office or, uh, you know, the Aston Martin appearing and little little things that, to remind the audience, OK, this is still our Bond film, you know, but they're really it's not daniel craig is not the same bond as pierce brosnan was i mean it's a different universe definitely you know it's a different time different timeline yeah i I don't know why people latch onto the concept that there needs to be some sort of continuity in 25 films it's clearly a delineation in this film but yeah i also believe i also believe judy dench's m is not the same m in the pierce brosnan movies 
Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. People, people were making that mistake too. Mm-hmm. Um, though, for those who have never seen this film, somehow, here is your letterbox. <laughs> go box. away. Yeah. <laughs> Just why, go away. <laughs> why are you listening? Find some other podcast. Who needs you, really? I mean, come on. Casino Royale 67. Check that one out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Peter Sellers is calling you. Um, yeah. Here is your letterbox.com synopsis. Casino Royale. Everyone has a past. Every legend has a beginning. Le Chiffre, a banker to the world's terrorists, is scheduled to participate in a high-stakes poker game in Montenegro, where he intends to use his winnings to establish his financial grip on the terrorist market. M sends Bond on his maiden mission as Agent 007 to attend this game and prevent Le Chiffre from winning. With the help of Vesper Lind and Felix Leiter, Bond enters the most important poker game in his already dangerous career. Boy, they really lost the punch of the movie with uh, that synopsis there. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't wasn't quite as good as it could have been, but uh, I, I guess it sets it up. I guess Raymond, you need to get on Letterboxd and punch that one up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, need, we need a writer, please. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, I I was a little confounded that they used Texas Hold'em as the game. Uh, yeah, uh, I would have preferred they stuck with Baccarat, but yeah. Minor quibbles. <laughs> as a as a man who doesn't understand poker, I still don't understand poker. I wish I did. I've tried. Baccarat, I just about get now. But uh, yeah, yeah po- yes. poker eludes me. Um, but I guess before we get to what we think about the film now, Cam, do you have even more on the storied beginnings of Casino Royale? Yes, and Raymond, feel free to jump in. If anything, uh, you know, you know more than I do for sure. So let me know if there's anything that is outstanding. But basically, yes, uh, the uh, option of doing Casino Royale had been very desirable for a long time. And um, the rights had obviously been a mess. And even at a point like Quentin Tarantino has said that he had mentioned to the Broccoli family that he would like to do a version of that. And Pierce Brosnan, I remember very publicly saying things about, oh, we'd love to do it with Quentin Tarantino. We'd love to do that. Uh, it, it does not sound like the Broccoli's were at all interested in, in working with Quentin Tarantino on a um, you know Casino Royale film. And so they decided that Die Another Day had pushed things a little too far and they needed to refresh. They were going through contract negotiations, which the stories of those with Brosnan are very messy, where it's like everyone has like a different version of what was happening, but it seemed like the negotiations were just stretching on and on and on. I don't even know that they were that excited about doing a fifth with him, but it was like they still were going through negotiations, and ultimately it seemed like from the various versions that perhaps his agent was pushing a little too far, and they were also lukewarm on just the concept of doing another film with him. So just decided to move on and adapt Casino Royale um, into a film as something of a restart. And so they brought on Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, who'd written you know a couple of the Brosnan films at this point. And they wrote up an initial draft. Um, at this point, they brought in Martin Campbell to restart it. And Martin Campbell, since we had met up with him in Goldeneye, had done a series of films. He did Mask of Zorro, which was hugely successful. He did Vertical Limit, um, Beyond Borders, which I don't know if people remember. That was an Angelina Jolie film. And he'd also done Legend of Zorro, which was less successful than Mask of Zorro on uh, a few different levels. But, you know, he was drawn back to this simply because it was going to be so different than what he'd done before. He's a guy who I constantly feel like they would like to have do more Bond movies, but he really has... Any, he doesn't seem to have any interest unless it's something he hasn't really done before. He's not like a sequel guy. And so that was the big pull for him. There's people that keep calling out for him to do the next Bond. I'm I'm happy with the two Martin Campbells we've had. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought, yeah, he, 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 was, he was very good. Um, both of them, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it was apparently him who suggested they bring in uh, Paul Haggis to do a rewrite on the script. Um, Actually, he he had a quote in uh, the Nobody Does It Better book, The Oral History, where he's just like, "Uh, I don't think Purvis and Wade do a lot for Bond. They kind of get the basics, but beyond that, you need to go a little bit beyond their work. Um, So Paul Haggis started off in 1980 in TV and had a, like, long you know, history on TV. He'd written originally on some animated shows like Plastic Man and Richie Rich and Scooby-Doo. 
before moving into sitcoms like Different Strokes and The Facts of Life, and ultimately becoming like a showrunner and creating shows like Due South, Walker, Texas Ranger, and Family Law. He didn't have a lot of film credits. He'd done a 1993 film called Red Hot, which was like a tribute to 50s rock music um, that really was something of a blip. I, I'd never even heard of this movie. Um, but it was 2004 where he shot Crash, and that movie would be released a little later, but would go on a real streak. Because in 2004, Million Dollar Baby, a movie he also wrote, would take Best Picture at the Oscars, and he would get a screenplay nomination. And the next year when Crash was released, it won the Best Picture, and he um, won the Best Screenplay for that as well. So he walked out with two Oscars, and so he was a hot commodity. So it made a lot of sense to bring him on. And he said originally he was just brought on to focus on the third act. He read the initial script and met with the Broccoli's and basically said, yeah, you don't have a third act. I can fix that. And so his main goal was to keep the focus on Vesper because originally they had her killed off and Bond would then kind of seek out the guys who had taken the money. And that would kind of be the ending. And he said, no, no, we need to keep the focus on Vesper right to the end. And his main interest was exploring Bond's relationships with women and the character's emotional armor. And so he said he rewrote that third act. And then they were like, can you rewrite the second act as well? And he said, oh, okay. So he did that. And then they were like, could you rewrite the first act as well? <laughs> and so it was a process where he was writing the script in reverse. And he said he never really saw the full script. Like he never sat down and had a full script draft. What a bizarre way to write a story. But then I, we've also heard Raymond saying about writing a whole book in six weeks. So these crazy mm. feats have been done in the Bond world by the sounds of it. Yeah, very true. And as for the big Bond search, um, you know, they auditioned a lot of actors for Bond. It's one of those things where you can just start listing off a whole string of names. And there were a lot of major names, you know, Christian Bale, Carl Urban, all, you know, met with the producers or tested in some capacity. But the, the ones they were looking closely at were Henry Cavill. Like that was the, Henry Cavill was the one that really had their attention. But um, he was only 22 at the time. And Martin Campbell really was championing him. He was the one that Martin Campbell said, that, that's the guy. Where was, where was Henry Cavill at this point? Was he even a name? No, no. And it's interesting because just other names, you know, Ewan McGregor, Orlando Bloom, um, Sam Worthington, uh, Goran Viznik from ER. Like these were all known quantities who were testing, but it was like Henry Cavill who was an unknown. Um, that was the one that at least Martin Campbell was really on board for. Which is fantastic, because they're still saying he's the top runner for it now, and it's, what, 18 years there is, gone? There is no top runner for it now. No. I, 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 I mean more in the fans' he, eyes, but yeah. So-and-so is, is, is being considered. It's all, it's all kooky. <laughs> I, I could buy that. I could buy that. I know the bookies like to tell you that uh, so-and-so's got good odds, but I imagine that they have no list. They have no whiteboard with faces on it right now. No. They do not. Let's just say no one got rich betting on Daniel Craig because no one was betting on Daniel Craig in 2006. <laughs> I actually knew who he was, though. I'd seen him in other movies. You know, had, had, had Leia Kate come out by this point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't like at least over where I, you know, in North America, at least it, it was not a huge name movie. I saw it for sure on video. I saw it before Casino Royale came out, but it wasn't one that when it was playing in theaters, we were particularly aware of, at least up here in Vancouver, B.C. And he was in Munich, mm -hmm. Munich, the Spielberg movie. Yep. Um, I remember watching Munich, and at that point, I knew he was Bond. I knew Bond was coming, and I remember just, like, squinting throughout Munich to be like, okay, this is Bond. Okay, like, can I see this? And, uh, yeah, that worked a little better. I can't recall if um, Infamous had come out. It came out the same year as Casino Royale, but I don't know if it was before. I think it was before, but I didn't see it until after mm -hmm. Casino Royale. That was the one where uh, it's the... Uh, Truman Capote story and Daniel Craig plays the killer. Um, yep. Uh, the in cold blood crime. Yeah, that one got overlooked a little bit because of Capote coming out first. Yeah, I know it did. And and frankly, I, I prefer Infamous. Uh, I thought it was a better movie. Right. Wasn't um, Archangel also part of this? Because I've heard that beating around. And we've obviously spoken to Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet in the past, and they wrote that as far as I, yeah they did write that um i i always heard that, that was also connected to it somehow 
yeah, that was something that the Broccoli's had seen and really liked. But they also cited things like they loved his character work in Road to Perdition. Um, they really appreciated his work as the poet Ted Hughes in the movie Sylvia, which that movie is very obscure. Um, and then when they saw Layer Cake, they just they, he was a leading man. They could see that he could carry a movie. And so like it was not really just like one thing. It was a string of things. But Archangel was definitely one of them. Um, and so, you know, they did the big announcement of Daniel Craig on October 14th, you know, in 2005, where they brought him down, you know, the Thames in the boat. And that just fed more fuel because of the life preserver. And it was just like this ongoing case of people not trusting Craig until footage leaked out from the paparazzi of him coming out of the water. And that was the thing that really turned the tide where people said, okay, we think this guy might be able to play Bond. <laughs> uh well, yeah, you, you see him in those blue boxes. I think that was sell it for a lot of people. Certainly sold it for me. Definitely, definitely. And uh, just some of the other casting. Scott, when we did our Salt episode, we were talking about Angelina Jolie um, being approached about a Bond film. And we were debating which one it was. It was actually this one. Huh. We thought it might have been Die Another Day, but it was this one. Um, basically, the producers always wanted Eva Green. They had seen her in the movie The Dreamers, the Bernardo Bertolucci movie. And she was busy. She was committed to another movie. And they basically kept going back and forth to see if they could get her, but they had to explore other options. And according to the casting um, director, Debbie McWilliams, she said there was a whole lot of names. A lot of people you know, were looked at, but only two people were considered viable options if Eva Green was not available. And that was Angelina Jolie and Charlize Theron. I mean, both fantastic actors. Yeah, I knew of Ava Green uh, from from the Dreamers. That's where I first was aware of her, and mm -hmm. yeah, I was kind of stricken by that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> because of the back and forth, like the movie Eva Green was committed to, ended up collapsing, and so she wasn't even cast in Casino Royale until two weeks into shooting. So they said it was a little nail biting because at that point. You know, you're already off and running. You kind of want to have your female lead cast, but uh, it all worked out. And Mads Mikkelsen um, was pursued by Barbara Broccoli after she saw the 2002 Danish film Open Hearts, which was a movie directed by Suzanne Beer, who did the you know directed episodes of The Night Manager. She also did Bird Box, and this was a Danish film. And this is why when people talk about odds makers, for example, on James Bond. Barbara Broccoli is a very different producer who, whenever you look at who she's casting, she's watching movies that people have perhaps never heard of or only cinephiles really know about. Right. And that's who she's looking at yeah. for these movies. And that's something that I think a lot of people... She has, she has very broad taste. She has very broad... She sees art films. She she knows the whole mm -hmm. the whole gamut of, of movies. She's a very smart lady. Uh, I, I knew of Mads Mikkelsen from a movie called Adam's Apple which was also a Dutch film. And I had seen it in 2005 uh, at a film festival in Italy, which coincidentally also featured a film that Purvis and Wade had written. Um, I, the name escapes me now, but they, they were in competition with Adam Zappel. And Adam Zappel won, won the film festival. And I thought, this guy is really good, this guy that was in Mads Mikkelsen. That's the first time I'd ever seen him. So when I heard he was cast as Le Chiffre, I just kind of went, oh, that will be really interesting. And, you know, and I knew Jeffrey Wright from, you know, uh, lots of things. Uh, he was a, you know, a theater actor. And um, I thought that was interesting casting. Giancarlo Giannini, I've known since the 70s. You know, he was the big star of Lena Vertmuller's movies, uh, Seven Beauties. He got nominated for an Oscar uh, and he was fantastic in it. Um, so I knew I knew him right off the bat. Uh, I kind of wondered what had happened to him <laughs> because he was <laughs> he was huge in the seventies, and then in the eighties and nineties you kind of hardly ever saw him, and then suddenly he was back, you know. And as I was kind of went, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing him in Hannibal. I think that was where I became somewhat more aware of him. Uh -huh. I think, um, but yeah, and so like you know, Mads Mikkelsen, it didn't seem like there was many alternate villain options. They were really pursuing him. And he actually initially was like, I'm busy. I can't, I can't, but they kept pursuing him. And ultimately I think things worked out pretty well there. 
Um, just in terms of uh, behind the scenes challenges, we were talking about, you know, Texas Hold'em and <laughs> Scott saying that he doesn't really understand it. Martin Campbell didn't either. And that scared the crap out of him. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> basically, um, Michael G. Wilson was really into poker uh -huh. and would hold poker school for the cast and crew. And they would play with real money. And he uh, was very much the sensei of poker on the set. And uh, Martin Campbell apparently binged just card movies like Cincinnati Kid, Maverick, Five Card Stud. He just was watching them endlessly, trying to figure out how to convey poker in an interesting way on screen. And he said basically he just realized it's about the players, not about the cards. Yeah. So just focus on your two main characters who are in the scene together. You'll be fine. So the movie had a budget of about $150 million. Domestically, it did 167.4, which was actually a little bit more than Die Another Day, making it a very high-grossing Bond film for that era. And uh, International did 449.1, which was like almost double what Die Another Day did. So internationally, it was huge for a worldwide total of 616.5 million. In comparison, Die Another Day had done 432 um, or worldwide. Hang on, hang on, Cam. If you listen to people on the internet, mm. apparently this film killed the franchise. So how does that make sense? <laughs> they didn't. They don't say that now. They said that in like 2005. There's still people out there now saying that this was the death of Bond, uh, and 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 apparently not even canonical, which it blows my mind. Uh, shout out to those yeah, people. Whatever. Get outside and touch some grass, please. Who listens to people on the internet? Oh, come, on. come on. Who needs them? Who come needs them? <laughs> Uh, no, I, you know, I actually know Bond fans who never liked the Daniel Craig movies from the get go. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's, you know, I don't know what they're looking at or what they, you know, what they're basing that on. Uh, you know, maybe they want more humor and more silliness, uh, in their Bond films. Uh, but you know, Casino Royale really captured Fleming's novel. Uh, they had to create a, you know, completely new first act because the novel is very short. Uh, and, you know, the bulk of the novel is the casino scenes. Um, so they, they knew they had to flesh it out. And I thought they did a great job doing that. But once, you know, especially once they get to what is the adaptation of the novel, which is act two and three, it's, it's very faithful. It's, it's updated to the present day, but, um, it really captures it. And, you know, Craig was playing Bo uh, Fleming's Bond. He, um, yeah. You know, just to talk about the actors real quick. I will always love Sean Connery because he was my first. Um, yep. I tend to say, you know, there is Sean Connery and then there's all the others. Uh, so Connery will always be my favorite no matter what. And, and but, um, you know, I really liked Dalton. I thought Timothy Dalton also was attempting to do Fleming's Bond, and I think he succeeded. Um, he was playing it seriously. In fact, I, I really thought Eon was trying to do with uh, License to Kill what they eventually did later with Daniel Craig and his movies. Mm -hmm. They were trying to make an edgy, serious, violent, hard-hitting Bond film with License to Kill. And I know it's, it was very controversial. Some people didn't like it. I really liked it. But I don't think people were ready for it then in 1989. They were not ready for a serious bond. Uh, so we kind of got back to the more, you know, uh, pizzazz, glamorous bond with the Brosnan films, which is fine. You know, uh, they were good. They made a lot of money. Um, Brosnan was great. Um, but now, you know, once we got into the 2000s, you know, we were in the middle of a war and you know we'd gone through 9-11 things were just darker and i thought that approach really fit with what fleming did uh you know he wrote casino royale in the doldrums of post-world war ii uh when england was still trying to kind of get back on its feet and the cold war was was a serious threat and so, you know, his, his, his books of the 50s really capture all that. Um, so I think they, they were totally correct in making Casino Royale this dark, realistic, violent uh, treatise on what 
what the spy world is at that time. And I mean, this movie connected with the zeitgeist. It landed at number four yeah. at the international box office that year. Um, it, uh, you know, the top five, number one was Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. Number two was the Da Vinci Code. It's hard to remember now that the Da Vinci Code is a real phenomenon. Uh, number three was Ice Age 2, The Meltdown, then Casino Royale, and it just beat out Night at the Museum. A lot of family films on there. What a sandwich that is. What, what a sandwich indeed, what, what, indeed. What was number, what was number one? Uh, number one was Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. Are you serious? <laughs> that was terrible. Yeah, yeah, it was. That was terrible. The excitement, <laughs> the excitement for that first sequel was palpable. People oh, were oh, so God. excited about that second one, and then you know, it was... I was so disappointed, and I was so disappointed in that movie. I just like walked out going, "Oh, that was horrible." Um, yeah. Let's be fair. In that top five, there's really only one good movie, and it's Casino Royale. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Casino Royale was my number one film of that year. Uh, and I rarely say that about a Bond film. Um, so, um, yeah, that was my number one. I, gee. Yeah, it, it's it's funny. Like, the Oscars did not agree. <laughs> like, uh, the, the, the British were on the right page because the BAFTAs very much celebrated this movie. The Oscars, zero nominations, but the BAFTAs gave it a, a win for best sound, but it was nominated for screenplay, actor, cinematography, editing, production design, and visual effects. So Scott, you guys were on the right page. Yeah. Well, BAFTAs, BAFTAs are, uh, tend to favor British uh, films too. And good films. Um, no, but I agree. <laughs> I agree with your assessment. You know, the Oscars have not been kind to Bond films, um, except quite recently, maybe, you know, with a few little technical nods and music nods. You know, it's, yeah. well, it still boggles my mind that John Barry was never nominated for an Oscar for a Bond score. That's just... It's insane. It's, that, it is insane. Uh, just like Ennio Morricone was never nominated for a Spaghetti Western score. So... Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think that wraps us up on the behind the scenes. And Cam, I think you've uh, stripped our armor away. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We're, let's talk about it. Casino Royale, it's the year 2022. What do we think about this film? Raymond, you're the guest. I'll go to you first. What's like your top line review of the film? What do you think about Casino Royale now? I, what I said before, I think it's one of the best Bond films ever made. Uh, it's very faithful to Fleming. It, uh, it, it, uh, it's hard hitting. It shows uh, a, an actor portraying the literary Bond very, very well. He may not look like what is described as the literary bond, but does it matter? Uh, to me, it didn't. And, you know, I think it's well shot. It's beautiful to look at. It's got a great score. It's got a great cast. Uh, I don't think there is a false move really in it. I mean, I, like I said, I would have preferred it had been Baccarat, but, who, you know, in the long run, it's a minor quibble. Um, Sweetie. I think it's, it, it's pretty much a perfect Bond film. I, I, it's, it's hard to argue with that assessment. And I think you know, we had um, Calvin Dyson on a couple of years ago, I think at this point, to talk about Goldfinger. And we all sat there saying, how do we talk about what is potentially one of the perfect Bond films? How do you critique it? What, what do you do? Because you know, oh, oh, that little thing didn't work. Raymond, you mentioned the Baccarat. It's a fair point that would rub some people the wrong way. And yeah, absolutely right. And it's tough to evaluate. And so... Uh, Cam, I'll throw it to you in a second. Sorry for jumping in and throwing the order off. But like, no, no. For me, when I talk about films, especially franchise films and like genre films, sometimes they manage to create something that goes beyond the franchise itself. I think of something like Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is not just a good Star Trek film. It's a good science fiction film. It's actually a good film. Character-driven film. Character-driven film. Absolutely. And... I think this Casino Royale, the 2006 version, of course, is the Bond equivalent of that. It goes beyond being a good Bond film and goes into the realm yes. of being a fantastic film, period. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, that's why I, you know, I name it my number one film. Of, uh, I, you know, I'm a big film historian. I teach film history. Uh, I, I'm like Barbara Broccoli. I appreciate art films and, you know, foreign films and all that. And um I think Casino Royale was the best, my favorite film of, of the year. I don't like to use the word best because uh, it's subjective. Uh, but yeah, if, if, if I was handing out the Oscars, 
that year. I would have nominated <laughs> Casino Royale and given it to it. So, and this was not a particularly strong year for the Oscars either. Like this was actually a very poor year. So the fact it didn't get nominated is that much uh, that, that much more painful. Departed won, but I, and I like Departed, but I do like the Departed. I think it's a mm-hmm. pretty great film. I liked Little Miss Sunshine a lot. Another one of my favorite films that year was Children of Men. Great uh, film. Oh yeah, I, I thought that was a terrific movie. Um, um, what else? Uh, there were some others, but uh, those Borat were... was a big breakthrough. Oh, Borat was great. <laughs> Borat was yep. really funny. Yeah, what a weird Borat. juxtaposition: Bond, Casino Royale, and Borat in the same yeah, movie. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, a weird but, year. Yeah, but no, uh, you know, The Departed. You know, Scorsese had needed his. Do- you know, he he never got the jackpot, and he finally did. And uh, and and I thought it was a better. As a remake of Infernal Affairs, it was far superior, although I do like Infernal Affairs. But Scorsese took that and just made it soar. Uh, I thought it was a great film, but Casino Royale, that's, yeah. I'd rather have that. Well, indeed. Cam, what about you? Like, What did you think now of Casino Royale? I mean, I, it's funny you were just talking about how it sort of exceeded what you know, you think of perhaps the limits might be with, you know, genre entertainment or a franchise entertainment. And I remember like Roger Ebert had a quote where he, I don't remember which Bond movie it was, but he said basically that Bond movies could be great entertainments, but not great movies. And I think like that holds somewhat true um, before Casino Royale. And I think even he admitted like this one was the one that I have to revise that rule because I don't know that like, Casino Royale, if you ask me on a given day, is my favorite Bond movie, but I think it's the best Bond movie. I think it's the one that nails all of the elements in an interesting way. It's the first one that really tackles with interesting themes that carry through the course of the movie. It has, you know, Barbara Broccoli has just more of an, I think, you know, art film pedigree and understanding of that kind of world. It feels like it's merging all the things you want from franchise entertainment, things like, you know, the parkour chase, the big action, all the kind of the flashier elements, but working in a level of intimate character drama, you just previously never really got in this franchise. I think you have a pretty solid organic growth with Bond's relationship with women, you know, starting with the really the Dalton era and going through the Brosnan era, but this feels like next level. And I just had to admire watching the movie the other night. I was looking at the counter a lot because I wanted to pay attention to just how the movie broke down in terms of kind of chunks. And when you have Vesper Lynn, she's introduced at the 58 minute mark. And the scene in which she's kidnapped and, you know, hauled away and essentially kind of sets up the reveal of what this character has been up to is basically 45 minutes later. And so really the core of the entire relationship between those two characters of Bond and Vesper is 45 minutes of screen time that's mixed in with card games, fights in hallways and staircases, you know, stuff with Felix Leiter. And you just have to admire how unbelievably efficient they were in layering in this love story that carries you through the whole movie and makes it seem so simple. Like this movie makes every element feel simple and it had to be a lot of work. Like, I have to believe, you know, the Broccoli's are very hardworking. I'm sure there was a lot of sleepless nights putting this movie together. But it all comes across so sophisticated and graceful on screen that it's the type of movie I think a lot of producers look at and say, we want to do that, but the odds of achieving that are very slim. Yeah, this is definitely the one you shoot for, isn't it? Like This this is the, I I don't want to say it's the pinnacle, um, but... Mm -hmm. And we mentioned earlier, Raymond mentioned it actually, the, the, the roots of this back to things like uh, The Bourne Identity. And there's lots of films that it's taking things from. But if you go back to our uh, Bourne Roundtable episode, and, and John Orty, our guest from Behind the Stunts, was talking about how it, it really just like grabbing things that worked in other parts of the franchise and spy movies and action films at the time and brought it all together into the successful package along with 007. I mean, what a way to reintroduce a character to potentially a whole new audience. You think about the watershed moment you had with Goldeneye that brought a lot of people back, brought me into Bond, personally. This is another one of those moments in the history of the character. Definitely, yeah. I mean, and just how quickly they set up their Bond. Because I've talked about in the past, like, watching, for example, Goldeneye the first time and, like, spending a lot of the movie kind of reframing 
okay, this guy is James Bond. I have to get used to this. And, you know, being you know, by the time, you know, you rewatch the movie and you go into Tomorrow Never Dies, you're 100% on board. But I remember, you know, initially it's kind of that learning curve of like, oh, I have to kind of learn to accept this new actor and what he's doing with the role. I did not have that with Daniel Craig. That opening of the black and white sequence, it, it just instantly clicked. There was never a second in the moment where I was struggling with him as Bond. The Bond was different. I'd never seen this version on screen, but it felt entirely Bond. I love the opening. Um, I, th mm -hmm. I think it's one of the the great pre pre credit sequence. I do have one other minor quibble. I wish they hadn't played around with the gun barrel logo <laughs> in the first. <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't get me started on the gun barrel in the Craig era. <laughs> I, I'm really fond of that gun barrel logo, and and they really kind of messed with it uh, the first three films. They finally got it back in place for the for Spectre and No Time to Die. Uh, but uh, I wish they hadn't have done that. But you know, minor quibble. You've got two now. You'll you'll have your six soon. <laughs> well, let's 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 take it over to things that we do like. Um, uh, let's just pick a thing. I I've got a moment, but Raymond, I'll throw it to you. Just something. It can be a moment from the film or something about the film that really stands out to you. Well, pretty much everything. Um, like I said, the pre credits black and white sequence is really awesome. Really kind of brings this sort of noir feel to it. That. Uh, we've never really had before in the franchise. Um, the, you know, when, you know, the, the iconic scene of Bond coming out of the water and showing that fantastic physique he has, uh, you know, I, I could feel all the women in the, in the theater kind of go, <gasps> <you know? laughs> and even, even I kind of went, wow, <laughs> that guy's, <laughs> I know I did <laughs> double O heaven. <laughs> yeah. Gee. Uh, uh, the, um, I thought the, the scene at the airport where he's trying to stop the bomber was really exciting. It was very well edited and, and, and shot and cut. And then once we got to the casino, it was all familiar territory because I knew the book in and out. And they were really, you know, even despite the adaptation to modern times and, you know, changing up just a little bit, it did follow kind of the sequence of events. And I was really digging it. It was just like, oh man, this is Bond. This is Fleming. This is Bond. This is Fleming. I was, I was really excited. Um, I loved, um, I loved Mads Mikkelsen and the fact that they did the torture scene. Yeah. Uh, not with a paddle, but they did. You know, I mean, you know, what, the device didn't matter. What they were doing to him was was what it was. And I never thought I would see that on screen ever. Uh, but we did, and it was, wow, it was really tough. I mean, that was a tense scene. It was brutal. Yeah. It was brutal to watch. It was. And Craig, Craig was amazing, and so was Mads Mikkelsen. He was really, they were both exceptional in that scene. And they've talked about, like, that scene was actually very easy to shoot. They did it in about a day. And the whole, wow. like, thinking was, like, oh, man, that must have been brutal. That must have been days on end. And they said, like, you know, I think it was Mads Mikkelsen said, like, they were just so on point. They knew their characters so well that that scene was just like very easy to realize versus maybe some of the other ones, which were more technical challenges. Right. Right. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but I wrote a stage play based, uh, adapted from Casino Royale. Did you know that I was commissioned by Glid Rose to, to write a stage play? That hadn't come up in my research. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. This was in the 80s. 1980s, mm. around 1985, after The Bedside Companion was published. I was right. still doing theater, and, and I talked to them about, um, why hasn't there been a stage play, a Bond stage play? And they said, well, Eon has all these rights and everything, you know, except for Casino Royale. And I went, well, that's the one that would be <laughs> the most adaptable to the stage because it's not a lot of outdoor sequences, you know, and they kind of thought about that. And so they commissioned me to write a stage play. Uh, I did it. and in New York, we had a staged reading of it. Unfortunately, the Glidrose people could not come over and attend it. So it only had that one staged reading and uh, it was a success. But then, I don't know, some, I think some agent or something in a theatrical agent in Britain just kind of said, Bond will never work on stage. And so they, they dropped the idea. And then the, the script kind of went into limbo um, because you know, Eon eventually got all the rights. And so 
the production rights belong to Eon. The publication rights belong to Eon Fleming Publications. So I don't own a thing. <laughs> I own I own the paper that it's typed on. Um, right. So you know we'll never see it. But you know I, I was intimately and in, you know I, I intimately know Casino Royale very well, and I did do the torture scene on stage with a with a naked James Bond character actor. That was going to be my question. Was going to did well. A did the torture scene make it? So it sounds like it was a yes. Yeah, yeah. And the way I devised it was that you would build a a, a chair with a false box with a, you know, it would it would have a a, a, a barrier mm-hmm. that the audience couldn't see, uh, and so the, the front the the legs would be covered and the sides so that the guy could still hit it, you know, from the bottom, and you'd hear the boom, you know. Um, and they would not know that it's, you know. And and was it Baccarat or poker? It was Baccarat. And uh, the way I did that, you had screens above the tables. Uh, so you could see the hands of mm-hmm. what they were holding, the cards. Um. Well, I mean, Cam, what about you? Something you want to highlight? This is a very difficult one. I think with a lot of movies, there's like a, a standout element. But like with me... I kind of sit where Raymond does, where it's like all of the elements are just firing on all cylinders. So it's like to kind of like mention, you know, Mads Mikkelsen's unbelievable performance. You're like, well, hold on. That's just a a fraction of what works. To me, it's like this movie just crystallizes everything that's effective about Bond. And, you know, Raymond, you're mentioning the action. And I think that was, I think, a bit of a concern that maybe people had initially when they talked about rebooting you know, the the franchise and bringing Bond back in this kind of more stripped down form was like, well, we like these movies as action movies. And I think one of the genius elements of this movie is the way it manages to deliver character drama, but also inject all the action fans we're familiar with. I think that really helped get them on board because not only were they getting action, they were getting action that was among the best we've ever gotten in the franchise, if not the best. That opening parkour chase is, I mean, next level. Um, even you know rewatching it just the other night, it's unbelievable the stunt work going on, how they conceived that sequence, and that was um, I believe um, Gary Powell and Martin Campbell were the ones that basically bashed that one out themselves. That was not written into the screenplay. That was the two of them working that through, and it's just an unbelievable sequence, and that extends to the whole movie. Like they're shooting scenes that could be you know in a different movie, maybe a little flat, like the card game. And they shoot it with the intention intensity of like an action sequence so that the movie just pulls you. It's so propulsive. And the fact that it's just buoyed by this collection of just killer performances, it just feels like it's, it's a ride. Like it's an incredibly well-paced two hour and 20 whatever it is minute movie. And I have seen a lot of movies that are two hours that drag. Scott and I have covered movies that are what, like 85 minutes that drag. And the fact that this one just flies by is a real testament to, you know, the filmmaking and just the fact that like with all of the elements just crystallizing together into something so known, but at the same time, almost like a rediscovery, it just manages to capture your imagination consistently. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm so glad and I mentioned it at the top, but I'm so glad that we have both Sebastian Foucan and Joseph Milson this week from that crane scene that you mentioned, Cam just to sort of help us break that scene down two separate interviews for you there i mean both fascinating and different perspectives on the scene as well one's more action focused a little bit more character focused um and yeah breaking that down and and all the influences you know as as john said everything sort of conversing to one big unit in this this big bond film and trying to reinvent it um i imagine i can understand what people were scared uh, and it being this whole new way of delivering a bond story but I, I think that definitely stuck the landing. For me, if I'm picking out something, and as Cam said, as Raymond said, there's so many things you could choose to highlight. I mean, I, I was going to talk about the amazing sort of relationship that's built up in that short period of time between Bond and Vespa. It's so it's like delicate and loving and caring, which is not something we've seen fairly often from Bond. We've seen it a few times. I always think about Bond and Cara in The Living Daylights. I think that's a very touching relationship too. Diana Rigg. Um, Diana Rigg, of course, on Her Majesty is great, cool. Um, but like, for me, I think I'm going to go more on the sort of aesthetics of it all, and and things like the score is fantastic. They, 
a new sound. They're bringing a new Bond theme, basically. And the whole You Know My Name with Chris Cornell, like I mentioned at the top, that whole tune sort of sticks through the C- Craig run. They create a new sound for 007. And then, like, you think about the Daniel Kleiman credit sequence. Is that the best they've ever created? I it It's so visually stunning. I think I've watched it four times on YouTube today just to sort of try and break it down. There's so much going on in that title sequence, and it's just gorgeous and everything is firing on all cylinders i i i'm uh, we're going to go to dislikes in a second and i'm struggling to prepare myself for what i'm going to talk <laughs> about it's 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 really tough but for me like sound is very important i'm a musical person and this film has such a unique sound um not just in sound design as well like even things like they, they went out their way to record the aston martin in all the different ways to make it sound more aggressive when it drives and uh, it, so much effort and care was taken into put into this film, and uh, I I think it what well, still shows now. It doesn't feel like a movie made by people that have been making James Bond movies for X amount of years. In a way, it almost feels like sometimes when they hand a franchise to, you know, new filmmakers who have like this life they want to bring to it, they're so excited, and it's so exciting to see these veteran producers feel that energized again about creating a new universe and really falling in love with what they're doing. Like, that doesn't always happen. You know, so often we're disappointed when you have these veteran filmmakers returning to a franchise that they've left behind, and it doesn't usually work out. And just to see them so energized, just what, like four years after Die Another Day, and having an entirely different creative spin, it's just unbelievable to see. Yeah. It, I, I, again, like I said, it's a hard one to review because there's so much to, good to talk about. But Well, I, I do have maybe one thing that would be a way of kind of showcasing things. What's everyone's favorite performance in the movie? I would say Craig. I would say I would say Craig's. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, without if if he hadn't have been as good as he was, the movie would not have been as good. Um, I think Craig sells it. Um, after that, I would say Mickelson. Okay, so like Mickelson for your supporting is the one that really jumps out. And oh, yeah. why does why does he jump out so much to you when you examine him? Obviously, against the rich pantheon of Bond villains. Well, he was very sinister, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the Bond villains are kind of campy. You know, you got to admit it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they do oh, have yeah. their <laughs> moments of chewing the scenery. Mickelson, Joyfully so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mickelson doesn't do that. He's he's very you know he's creepy in this movie. Uh, you know the the scar, you know the makeup and the scar and everything, and um, his sort of. Every when he does allow himself to laugh at something, it's just kind of a, you know. Uh, I thought he was. I thought he really was chilling. He was. He was real. I love the way he um, flips like the chip, the chips in his hand. Oh yeah, yeah through the yeah. the poker scenes, like yeah. so cool. Yeah, and yeah. just like all these like little touches he brings, just it's like they all just add up. And I love like kind of the sweatiness and desperation of the character because. Right. He's someone who's so controlled, but like that makes him seem even scarier is when he starts getting scared himself. Right, right. Well, look, during the torture scene, when Bond has the quip about, you know, please a little more to the left. And you can see Mickelson at first kind of goes, what the fuck is he talking about? And then he kind of reads, oh, he's joking. And he kind of allows himself to kind of laugh at that. Oh, you know, you've got a sense of humor. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was perfect. You know, I mean. Great characterization. And very different from what we'd seen before when yeah. you look at, you know, Orson Welles. There was no magic act. <laughs> that would have been uh, well, amazing halfway through the card game. <laughs> Where was the levitation? I needed levitation in this film. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or uh, Peter Laurie as well in the, uh, in the you know, the climax episode from the right. 50s. So it, I, it was, again, just really appreciated that they had entirely different tact on that character and really made him come to life. Um, what about you, Scott? I was thinking about it whilst you two were just talking there, but I, I think I'm going to go for Eva Green, actually. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with Raymond. I like Daniel Craig sells the film. Oh, yeah. There is, everything is on that guy's shoulders, and he's got big shoulders, so I think he carries it pretty well. <laughs> uh, but like Eva is, I think, the heart of the film. Mm-hmm. And there's a moment that drew me back in my second watch today when, when um, Bond drops off the dress, and then she drops off the dinner jacket. And there's dinner jackets, and then there's dinner jackets. And 
Bond puts it on, and it's the first time you see him in a tux, and it's kind of like a big reveal for the film. It's not really scored heavily, doesn't, it's not a heavy moment, but she just peeks around the corner and just smiles at him, looking at himself in the mirror. It's like a little bit, a little fun way of disarming the character, making it kind of funny, and but not like ha 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 funny. It's it's just really nice. I, I still have problems with how the Vespa character is sort of wrapped up at the end, but that's not on Eva Green. That's more of a, I just have trouble with that character's arc, personally. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Eva Green all the way for me. But what about you, Cam? I also, it's the Eva Green performance, I think, just like really, not only just carries through this movie, but also hangs over all the, you know, Craig films to come. And it's like, I think just the, the intelligence of the filmmakers to have scenes like, you know, where she's in shock after the fight on the floor of the shower and they're sitting in there. Like, you didn't get scenes like that traditionally in Bond movies. Like, there's a vulnerability to that relationship that really works. But I think one of the most genius moves they made, period, was, like, in her first scene on the train was where her and um, Bond, like, size each other up. And, um, like, Bond isn't particularly right in sizing her up. Uh, Like, he's talking about, you know, how she's single and all this sort of stuff. And um, it's, like, elements like that, I think, are really smartly worked in the fact that Throughout the movie, you don't know who her character is, but also at the same time, you know, Bond is saying, like, this is a character with no tells, and we are genuinely surprised, I think, by the reveal. Like, they're using well-worn source material, so anyone who had read the book knew ultimately where that character was going to go, but if you hadn't read it, I don't think you would have seen necessarily where it was going to go and i think they do a very good job working in kind of the theme of like bond's relationship with women the way that like you know you have the the death of um solange earlier in the movie and then you realize like that what bond what can happen when bond is involved with women but then how he emotionally reacts by the end of this story um and the coldness that he brings on initially and so like it's the way that they managed to balance that relationship that i think is so effective and eva green just consistently works and just the idea of basically people showing their hand is a theme carried through the entire movie and the idea of reveals tied into the poker yeah we interrupt this program to bring you a special report calling all agents independent podcasting much like the spy game requires considerable resources whether it's research equipment hosting or of course constructing a top secret volcano lair we're putting out the call for your support. That's right. As you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon, home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Well, Scott, we're continuing with the Dirty Airy franchise with 1973's Magnum Force. So do you feel lucky, punk? Well, do ya? And if that sounds delicious, then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before this message self-destructs, Cam, resume the spy jinx. Well, we've, we've said all the nice things about the film that we can. Let's just, if there's any critiques we can make. I know... Raymond, you, you've mentioned the Baccarat, and you've mentioned, uh, the, was it the chair, the, the, the other thing you had? There no, no, the gun, bar- the, the gun barrel. The gun barrel, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, what, a, what a nitpick, eh? Yeah, There's people listening that agree with you completely, to be absolutely fair, that like yeah. completely agree. But yeah. I'll throw it to you. Is there any other things about the film, just in retrospect now, that either you would change, as a, as a writer yourself, that you would change, or, or, or in presentation, but something you disliked, perhaps? I can't think of anything. Uh... I mean, Scott, you're you're not gonna like this, but I'm not a huge <laughs> you're not I'm not a huge fan of the the theme the the main title of the song. Okay, okay, no, that's absolutely fine. What about it doesn't work for you? I, I rank it fairly low on the list of main title songs. Sure, I'm sorry, but uh, don't don't apologize. Yeah, it's fine. It I mean it was okay. Uh, I just felt like it wasn't you know it didn't have a melody that was an earworm, you know. Usually you can walk out of a Bond film and you know the theme of the movie. You know you can you can walk out humming "You Only Live Twice" or "Goldfinger" or uh, you know even you know nobody does it better or uh, "For Your Eyes Only." <laughs> you know I'm naming some of the iconic ones. Um, 
you know, I could not recall the theme song after I walked out of the movie and even later. Um, so I had a problem with that, but it was okay. I mean, you know, you watch it. It fits, it fits with the movie at the time. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm curious, you know, Raymond, how, how do you feel about, you know, larger picture, just the song choices of the Craig era in general? Uh, the last three, I think, are pretty good. Uh, the first two. So you're a fan of the Spectre one? Yeah. The the second one is probably be my least favorite title song of all of them. Would it be fair to say you lean more towards the ballads then? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I do. Because, I don't know, tradition is tradition. Um, and they tend to have a melody that, that works more in fitting in with the, the rest of the score. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about rock and roll as a, you know, heavy, heavy metal guitar, uh, working really. Uh, I mean, there was live and let die, but that was different. That wasn't just, you know, in your face, electric guitar. It also has a reggae breakdown section, so like yeah, 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 exactly. It's all over the place. Yeah, I mean, but it was also orchestral, real, very mm-hmm. orchestral. Um, so th- that was kind of jarring for me um, with that kind of hard rock sound, and then then the rap, the rapping of the next one was really <laughs> jarring. <laughs> so, yeah, but they took uh, a swing. Yeah, you know, they tried. I, 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 I do think that David Arnold is it was a a, a, a good composer, and I, I like a lot of his score, um, especially the lo- the love themes, the the, the more lyrical mm-hmm. moments. Uh, I think are really good, and they really do kind of hark back to the very sound. Well, he may have had like one of the biggest challenges a Bond composer had in a long, long, long time, which was like they didn't want to play the Bond theme throughout the course of the movie until the very end. Until the very end, and I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, and he had to create this whole musical identity just without using the standards. There were hints. There were hints. There were hints of mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Like when yeah, he walks mm-hmm. in and first puts on the tuxedo, you kind of get the boom, boom, boom. Like it wants to go there, but nope, we're not going to give it to you yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought that was great. That was great. Um, I'll throw it to you then, Cam. What, what's your dislike if you're going to pick one? There's one little storytelling one that I struggle with, and it's the Mathis stuff dealt with towards the end, where we have Bond sitting at the table. He's just had dinner with Vesper after the poker game, and he goes, Mathis. And I feel like things get a little murky there as to the fact that it was her sending the, I guess, the the message to Le Chiffre about the card game. But I feel like that information is conveyed in a way that's very confusing. And it's something that I've gone back and, you know, I rewatched it multiple times at this point in my life, rewatched it the other night, and I'm just tracking it moment to moment. And I don't know that it comes across particularly clear. At the end, they're like, no, no, Mathis wasn't in on this. And it's like, okay, like, I feel like they're trying to communicate this to the audience because they didn't make it particularly clear what Mathis's role even was at that point in the movie. I agree with you. Uh, it's not clear why, how Bond leaps to the thought that Mathis betrayed him yeah uh in fact i was quite i was going no wait a minute how did he why did he think that and da, 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 you know i yeah you're right forgot about that there's the part two where bond's being tortured and um you know le Chiffre says oh he was my friend mathis and so it makes it even murkier <laughs> you're like wait hmm. what um so I-, I can kind of understand like in that craig moment if they where he has the revelation if there was like a flashback they want to show or something to indicate, but then they didn't want to because of the Vesper reveal coming. I have no idea. Like there was a choice made and I feel like it's murky. I, th- I think that's fair. Uh, I, I had trouble with kind of the wrap up of, of the film in, in some of people's allegiances and, and why Vesper turns still kind of bugs me, but I, it, it is what it is. What bugs you about it? It just, I I know at the end, sort of, M sums it all up for you and, and kind of tells you what happened, just about. But every time I hear it, I have to kind of go back and go, wait, why did she do it? Like, it's something to do with a boyfriend owed money and something like that. But I, I just feel like she's madly in love with this guy, and he's a secret agent. She could have just been like, hey, could you give me a hand here? Mm-hmm. And then it'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm James Bond. I'll help you out. And then it would have been absolutely fine. 
I I I feel like the 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 heel turn, if it is even a heel turn, feels just very quick, uh, and I never understand why she turns. Every single time I watch the film, that end bit just I struggle with it. I think I I know what you mean. I can kind of buy she wouldn't fully trust him because he's shown to be so reckless throughout the course of the movie Mm -hmm. that this is not the Roger Moore Bond or the Sean Connery Bond, you know, where I think you might have that trust in him pulling it off. The idea is he's reckless and he's blowing, you know, card games. He's like someone you wouldn't necessarily trust to get you out of trouble. But I, I think like it's... I can completely buy that, you know, she's in love with this boyfriend and is going to do this to save him. Mm-hmm. Like, that works for me. It's kind of the line tossed off by Judy Dench at the end where she says, well, she was, you know, trying to save you. That's why she did, was doing it. Which is entirely, like, I feel like an assumption on the uh, Judy Dench M's part. But, uh, yeah. Um, it, it works for me, but it is, I think, something that one could easily find quibbles with. And my only quibble I was going to bring up is actually... You know, Raymond took my music. Hmm. I'm going to take Raymond's tanker chase scene in the airport. Oh, for me, it doesn't particularly work. I don't like it that much. It feels like it could be any action film. It doesn't. It's not really a Bond thing to me. Apart from maybe switching the bomb around to the guy's uh, waistband, that's a nice little trick. And the smile. And the smile. But you could put John McClane in there. It would be the same thing. <laughs> I think they needed to get people on board. Because the first hour is essentially all the investigation and those big action sequences. Mm -hmm. I think they felt they needed to get people on board for the card game to come and more of the character drama. I really like that sequence on the tarmac. So I think it's just staged so incredibly well that like, is it necessary? I mean, maybe not, but I find it so propulsive and exciting that I don't care. I just don't care. It's interesting, though. It's the um, first of, I guess, two times where a Bond villain is going to dress up like a police officer to evade capture. We will see that again in Skyfall. Very true. Well, I think before we get to the knock list, uh, we're going to just any final notes just to throw it out there. Uh, Raymond, do you have any final notes on on the film itself? Anything that springs to mind? Anything you want to bring up? Uh, I just want to... Iterate, if, if anyone from Eon is listening, I think uh, this is one of the, you know, star achievements <laughs> of the entire franchise. And uh, Casino Royale is a great movie. Um, Daniel Craig is great. Um, I just, I, I think it's fantastic. And I think Ian Fleming would have loved it. So um, I think that's, that's important to say. <laughs> that is, that is mm-hmm. important to say. Very yeah, and yeah. a very good point. I, I I do agree with you there. But Cam, what about you? What do you have for final notes on Casino Royale? So to me, like, there's a lot of elements to me that also work, um, really unbelievably well. And when you're talking about Casino Royale, it's so hard to get granular because you're just more so impressed by the whole package. And we've talked about why that package works so well. Yeah, you are. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but there's like elements, you know, like just the Judy Dench performance, bringing that. You know, not the same character necessarily, but that kind of that fierceness and putting her opposite Craig and getting to see her sort of evolution starting of that relationship here. Jeffrey Wright, you know, kind of a small little role, but has so much impact. Like on my Felix Blandometer ratings, like he's not on the scale. We don't we don't measure Jeffrey Wright on the scale because he is just magnetic every second he's on screen like the support- he's the he's the felix lighter that's right he is the that's yeah. right yeah like to me we had never truly seen a felix lighter that stuck i think a lot of fans like david hedison a lot i do as well but if you ask a very casual bond fan about felix lighter you're gonna get blank stares and i think after jeffrey wright took over that's not the case I'm not sure I completely agree. I think he had a couple of just he was there for a little bit performances during his time with Craig. But maybe the second one, the second one. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm thinking of. But it, in this one and No Time to Die, actually, I think both standout performances. And you know, Let's just go back to M. We skip past Judy Dench coming back to the role. You know, sorry, continuity nerds, but this is a different M played by the same actor. But uh, I, I do find it interesting that Bond does say, oh, I didn't know M stood for, and it was implied that it was an M. So I'm going to say M stands for mother, and it's all connected to 1998's The Avengers. I think you just uh, broke the movie, Scott. You may have broken all cinema with that one. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah. Any reference to the Avengers, yeah. Um, but just like there's so many like little touches in this movie that make it all kind of work. Um, the fact that like the villains aren't dumb. Mm-hmm. A lot of Bond villains, they'll portray these like megalomaniacal kind of geniuses, but they're not necessarily the smartest people when you really break it down on paper. Um, look at Goldfinger just like hanging out with Bond at like a horse ranch throughout the course of the movie. It's like, just kill this guy. <laughs> but like, you know, you look at like even like kind of minor villain characters. Uh, for example, Carter at, at the start, who's like touching his ear. They pick up on that. They clock this guy as a spy. You also see when like, you know, the warlord um, shows up in the hotel to, you know, try to get his money back from La Chifra, And Bond is kind of like trying to put on this act of like, you know, making out with Vesper in the hallway so they don't look at him. That warlord spots that earpiece in his ear. Like it's very observant dangerous villains who aren't portrayed dumb they are not like disposable henchmen that like populate so many other bond films it kind of raises the level of tension of the movie by having villains who are able to kind of you know sniff out like bond being a potential adversary i i completely agree with the portrayal of the villains being very strong in this i it wasn't something i brought up in the dislikes and i don't know if raymond agrees or not but you know i thought that um one of the things this film struggled with is not having a central villain. Right. Like, if you're going to pick it apart, like, Le Chiffre is kind of the central villain. You've got Mads Mikkelsen. It's a big casting. It's probably the central villain, most people will say. But he's off at, like, the hour and 40 minute mark, and there's still another 40 minutes left of the film. Yeah, the villain is more, I think, the, like, the larger criminal conspiracy, because Mr. White is a strong element throughout this movie as well, who we haven't mentioned, Jesper Christensen, kicking off what is going to be, I think, a very effective ongoing villain arc and used very sparsely, but very effectively. So I, I feel like the Schieffer is such a small part of a larger picture that it's more about Bond exposing something and they aren't using the term, you know, Spectre by name yet, but that's kind of what they're hinting towards. Um, even at the time, though, when I saw the movie, it was like, oh, Le Chiffre is kind of like a low-level villain like this isn't a high ranking character we're kind of climbing a ladder that's going to go somewhere the sense Mm -hmm. of serialization was i think made very clear for moment one in this particular reboot like i think you knew that they were going to build to something so i don't hold it against the movie but yeah in comparison to other bond movies like uh, le chiffre is not hugo drax you know there from the beginning to the end no, I, but like in terms of as as we've all spelled out through this episode, these are minor gripes, and it's mm-hmm. really hard to pick any major flaw with this film because I don't think there is any. Yeah. Um. Another note I had was you know the Italian like recovery center Bond goes to after his traumatic torture. Mm-hmm. Did you recognize that place? I thought I did actually. I haven't looked it up, and I was going to. But is it connected to a certain Cary Grant film? It is. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. But um, the more obvious comparison is the place is called, and I'm going to butcher the name, so I apologize to any Italian speakers, Villa del Balbianello. Um, and uh, yeah, that, I'm sorry, folks. I want to apologize, but nonetheless, that was the. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. We're all sorry. <laughs> that was the location of Naboo from the Star Wars prequels. That's ah. the that view that he has is basically where you saw Anakin and Padme holding hands, getting married at the end of episode two, and it's featured throughout those prequels. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll have to look I I was thinking of the uh Cary Grant film To Catch a Thief. Oh, that was all in the south of France, I think. I don't think they went to Italy. Okay. It does have very nice vistas like that though with like large rivers. Mm. That was probably where I got the connection. Also a travelogue film, yeah. funnily enough. Yeah. Yeah. A um, couple other just little notes I had. The idea of like this being kind of the first reactive Bond as an action character. When you look at the other ones, Bond is very poised and cool. Um, he rarely seems to kind of be potentially, you know, scared or alarmed or anything. Like it's always a sense of Bond's in cool, kind of in control mode. Whereas like I like that this Bond is very reactive. He you know, takes in what's happening to him and responds. Like you think of the guy, you know, hurling the gun at Bond and Bond catches it and throws it back at him. But that carries through the course of the movie. Him, you know, barreling through a wall in the parkour chase. Mm -hmm. There's like a sweatiness and an effort to Bond in action in this movie that we'd never really seen before. You see shades of it in Dalton. We've seen the sweatiness with you. (laughs) That's true. That's true. Um, And David Niven. (laughs) 
<laughs> but like, um, yeah, like you have strong action stuff in the Dalton era, in the Brosnan era, but I feel like they took it to a next level, probably inspired by Bourne heavily, but like even still, there's a there's an exertion to the Craig Bond that we just really hadn't seen before. Well, it was something I was going to bring up in the like section, but you know, there was so many other things to talk about. Is this harder edge? Mm. And, and and Raymond, you know, you spoke about the connection to to License to Kill and, and Timothy Dalton. But you know, one thing I talk about with Sebastian Foucan in our Spy Master interview um, coming in the next couple of days is just the fact that this film does this the, the perfect cinema thing of show don't tell. It shows the powerhouse that Bond is and how he's he's got much more of an edge now. But it also has a softer side, but it doesn't like talk about it at length. You see Bond running through a wall to get to the suspect in question, to get to Sebastian Foucan's character of Malacca. That tells you more about Bond than, you know, 10 minutes of dialogue could. He is an unstoppable force. And, and you get that from just a man running through a dry wall. Yeah. And like this movie, you know, layers and things that are going to pay off in future movies. The whole. 007s having a low or double O's having a low life expectancy is something that's going to definitely pay off in a few movies from now. Um, Wait, what do you mean? I haven't seen No Time to Die yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not no spoilers, Scott. <laughs> oh, oh my. Yeah, just like various elements of this, and like the way this movie also builds in little reveals. You know, the mm -hmm. the the Vesper Martini. The tropes we know as Bond. We have seen movies that have done this horribly. I think of like Solo, a Star Wars story where they're revealing how he got his name and how he got his like holster and things like that. And it's so desperate. The dice. Yeah. The dice that was so important to Han Solo. Oh, God. It's so desperate. Whereas here, all of them feel very elegantly employed to the point where like they didn't even do all of them. They're like, oh, we can kind of work some of, some of the other things in later. It, it feels mm -hmm. all earned. So I, I really appreciate the movie. Well, you get the DB5 as well, like where mm -hmm. he first picks up the DB5. It's from a card game in Montenegro. Yeah, like that's kind of cool. Like it, it's and it's again almost. I'd say show don't tell. He doesn't say like, "Oh, this is gonna be my DB5 for life. I'm gonna import it back to London and put it in a box so I can rescue Judy Dench in Skyfall." Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't doesn't set anything up, but you just kind of get the idea that's where he picks up his DB5. And and I know you're gonna throw to me in a second about notes I've got, but my one note was just more of a discussion point. And that's about like, and this is kind of the retrospective kind of way. So it's kind of hard to talk about, but just maybe I'll just talk about it. But like, we don't know necessarily what we want anymore. They make reboots of things and go in different ways. This is a more action styled Bond. And it was well received. We were They, they stuck the landing on this one, okay? But you take like, other franchises that have come back and try to do it differently. You take like the, the Star Wars sequels. Okay, the first one was basically a riff of, of A New Hope, but they tried to do different things. Uh, you know, The Last Jedi was a, a different Star Wars film altogether. And that was panned by a lot of people. I, I don't know what The Rise of Skywalker was. But, and so like, I don't know whether, you know, I suppose like the question is, was it a good idea to, to, to roll the dice on this one? Yes, it paid off. Um, but when I hear people online saying about, oh, it should go back to, cause this I'm talking about now, like for Bond 26, what do people want? And they say, oh, it should go back to it being funny or we should go back to it being set in the sixties. I don't think we know what we want because I don't think people were clamoring for this in 2006, Yeah, but we got it and it worked. Yeah. That's like, I am far less willing to predict Barbara Broccoli than I might have been with the old, you know, when Cubby Broccoli was making the films, for example. Mm -hmm. Like, Barbara Broccoli's tastes, as we've talked about through the episode, are just so diverse that, like, I don't know what's popping out to her as a really exciting thing to do with the character because she has talked about how she doesn't think about what's going on right now. She's thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow. So I, I'm just really excited to see what her and Michael G. Wilson are going to come up with. Right. It's time. We're going to talk about the knock list. We're going to hop in the shower and turn up the heat. Raymond, you are our guest. The question goes to you first. The thing we do on this show every week is we like to talk about uh, the best spy movies ever. So every film we tackle, we ask if it makes the knock list, which is our list of the need to see official classics of Spy Hard. It's a terrible acronym. 
Cam came up with it. It wasn't my doing. I like that you say it's terrible and then assign me credit for that one. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, yeah. Ab- absolutely. But so uh, guests get a vote whenever they come on. Um, the question will go to you first. Knockless, the best spy movies of all time. Is Casino Royale 2006 making that list for you? Absolutely, it would. I think it would. I wish I'd known this question earlier. I would have prepared a list. Um, but, uh, you know, I can go back to the 1930s for, for good spy movies. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, some of my favorites would be, you know, Man Who Knew Too Much by Hitchcock, The 39 Steps by Hitchcock, The Lady Vanishes by Hitchcock. Um, Notorious. Notorious, mm-hmm. Notorious is one of my favorites. Um, Odd Man Out um, is terrific. Uh, the third man um there's some there's some wonderful stuff um gosh um and then you know in the 60s even though you know well from russia would love dr no from russia would love would be up there um i would they are on the list yeah yeah i would put the Ipcrest file in there um, damn right <laughs> <laughs> i'm with you raymond <laughs> uh, i would put, i would actually put our man flint in there for fun um, Yay! Yep. Hey! <laughs> yep, yes. that made the list. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I uh, put the parallax view in there. Um, Boom. The uh, you're, you're, you're naming our list right now, Raymond. This is perfect. <laughs> uh, the um, uh, uh, gosh, the name's escaping me now. Uh, the Robert Redford one in the seventies. Uh, um, three days of the condor. Three days mm-hmm. of the condor. Uh, yep. Yes, that one. Um, uh, terrific stuff. Um, Gosh, um, I wish I'd, yeah, if I'd known, I would have made a, 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 a list. So. You've really validated our show. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you've made, you've made us feel good about choosing these films, too. Like, a, a man who talk, who's written books about spies says these are the best ones, and so do we. So that's, that's good. Yeah, I'll, the, spy, I'll, the, spy who came, the spy who came in from the cold. Well, um, I'll um, what I'll do, I'll drop you an email, and you can send me your top ones, and I'll put them online, and we can, we can compare notes and see what people think. Okay. Um, there you go. Well, that sounds like a yes from you, Raymond. Cam, what about you? Big yes. Like, there is no shadow of a doubt in my mind that Casino Royale belongs on the list. Um, There's been debate about some of the, especially some of those Connery ones like You Only Live Twice or Thunderball, where it became much more of a discussion of iconography and sort of the movie's importance in pop culture and things like that. To me, Casino Royale doesn't need any of that. It has it. It definitely, you know, Batman Begins may have, um, you know, kicked off kind of the the gritty kind of reboot trend. Mm -hmm. Casino Royale continued in that and really delivered. But, like, I don't even need to examine any of that. All that I can put aside and say purely as a movie, as a a two-and-a-half-hour drama, as a Bond adventure, as an action movie, as a character piece, it all is just so solidly entertaining and just unbelievably elegant. So, to me... Big time, yes, it's on the knock list, 100%. Right, well, that's two yeses, so congratulations, gents. The film has made the list, but I still get a vote, so here is my two cents. Casino Royale 67 is much better than this film. (laughs) I'm kidding. Of course it's making the knock list. This is, I said it earlier, it's a watershed moment in Bond history. There's only a few. Goldfinger, Goldeneye, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, and probably this. Yeah, and I think even when you look at, like, cultural impact, I think it's Goldfinger. Thunderball's debatable because it was a huge phenomenon, but how much of that is because of the success of of, of Goldfinger, right? Like, mm-hmm. it, it's tough yeah. to say, right? Like Riding the wave, exactly. if you the pun. Exactly. Like, I think that you could really make an argument that uh, Casino Royale is the next biggest thing after Goldfinger. I think one of the matches is important too because it's the first one without Sean Connery. It is, but like not popular in its time, and it's one that is more popular with like Bond fans versus like your average, you know, Bond watcher. Yeah. Well, let's make it simple. It's a yes from me too. How could it not be a yes? It is potentially one of the greatest spy movies of all time, let alone one of the greatest Bond movies of all time. And so with that, three yeses. Of course, Casino Royale 2006 is making the knock list. And as such, the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. 
Well, Raymond, I want to thank you for joining us this week to talk about Bond, the 60th anniversary. What a big week. But before we let you go, what is it you're currently working on at the moment? Well, I have a new book coming out October 4th here in the States. Um, it's called The Mad, Mad Murders of Marigold Way. Uh, it is a dark comedy about a murder that takes place uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. I wrote it in May 2020, and that's when it takes place. Uh, well, I started it in May. That's when it takes place. Uh, and it takes place in my neighborhood, although I've changed the name to protect the guilty. Um, <laughs> and it's a, I tried to do a Coen Brothers style, you know, crime story. Mm -hmm. So it's got this sort of twisted absurdity to it that's, you know, hopefully funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's one of my favorite books I've written, and uh, it's coming out soon. So um, it'll be available on ebook and hardcover, and a month later on audiobook. Well, we'll uh, we'll put links to that in the show notes below, so people can find that uh, online and get a copy, of course. And I'll be grabbing one too. And you know, online, where can people find you? Like a website or Twitter, Instagram? Where where are you hanging around? Uh, well, RaymondBenson.com is my website. Uh, you can always find stuff there. Uh, my Facebook gets a lot of action. Uh, I have a personal page and an author page. The personal page is where all the action is, really. So uh, find me on there. Um, the author page is more just sort of announcements. Uh, Twitter is at Raymond Benson, and uh, you'll find me there, too. Perfect. So, yeah, we'll, we'll connect that all in the show notes below. And again, Raymond, thank you for taking the time to talk with us this week. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot. This was a lot of fun and uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'd, I'd come on again. <laughs> cool. We'll have you back. Don't worry. We've still got some Hitchcocks to tackle. Yeah, we've got plenty of Hitchcocks to go. Absolutely. Well, there you go, folks. We want to thank Raymond again for stepping in to the breach. I couldn't have thought of a better person to have on the show to lead us into the Daniel Craig era and to deal with such a an important Bond movie. Definitely. But... The party does not stop here. It's the 60th anniversary of James Bond. So we thought we would roll out the gold carpet and really celebrate Casino Royale. So we have two Spy Master interviews for you. Coming this Friday, the next episode release, we are sitting down with Carter himself, Mr. Joseph Milson. Hopefully he's not got his finger in his ear when he speaks to us. But uh, yeah, it's looking to be a really fun chat with him. And that's followed hot on the heels with Mr. Sebastian Foucan, who plays Malacca, who you will know from that crane sequence uh, as the man running away from James Bond. And, I mean, if you look at the chap's credentials, he basically invented free running. There's a lot to discuss, and it is a fantastic discussion with a lot of behind-the-scenes insight as to how that scene was put together. Uh, yeah, do not miss out on that. That's coming next tuesday from this release point uh but cam i believe we have one last present for everyone yes we are going to do a review of the 1954 television adaptation of casino royale from the tv series climax you know we've talked about casino royale 67 we've talked about 2006 let's go back to the origins when barry nelson was james bond or jimmy bond as i believe he was called Yes, I mean, it, it, we'll be discussing where this started, where the, the first adaptation of Casino Royale. And with that, we will be creating a trilogy of Casino Royale reviews. You can choose your favorite of the bunch. It'll just be me and Cam for this one. Uh, it's only a short episode, I think, about 50-odd minutes, because it's, of course, a TV show. Although keen listeners will know this does open the floodgates to more TV specials in the future. Hmm. Uh, that uh, I, I may regret opening these floodgates uh, but then again we did talk about the Harry Palmer TV movies that is also true we did for our sins yeah it's two full weeks of James Bond Casino Royale love and we hope you enjoy it uh, and if you do enjoy what you hear on the show please consider sharing the show telling your friends and leaving us a five star review wherever you get your podcast it helps us share even more James Bond love as we like to say we are the worst kept secret in spies hmm. uh, and do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram but 
Until next week, Cam, I've got a little, little itch.